Hi, this is Rahman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. Our guest for this fortnight is Andrew Paul Tankard. Andy is founder and director of New South Wales Country Safety Services, the only wholly owned, regionally based company specializing in safety, quality, risk and engineering assurance, based in the Riverina and servicing regionally based projects and business since 2022. Andy started his professional career in 1979 with British Rail. Andy was in senior management roles specializing in engineering safety and assurance. He was former senior executive manager with Transport for New South Wales. Andy loves art and passionate about community service. His journey from being a professional to community service, especially in the regional areas, Ups and downs in his personal life will definitely touch your hearts. Hi, Andy. Welcome to Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Andy, before I start, can you tell us uh, your journey with railways, please? Yeah, sure. It, it, I have to say it was a little bit of a haphazard journey in that um, I was, I was, I'm a child of the 60s, just. I was born in 1960 to the... Uh, to a working class family. I was the fourth child of a, of a family born to a, a homemaker um, and at the time a train guard, which, which is quite uh, fortuitous. I know that my dad got a job with British Rail around about the time I was born. So I was kind of like from day one immersed in the culture and I actually sometimes went with him to his work at Healy Mills Depot in Ossie uh, in West Yorkshire in the UK where he was based. And as a kid, yeah, I was a, very much a, a train spotter and a train fan. But that said, as I, as I moved through to school and, uh, and and into my career, I was I was very much unfocused. And ultimately, I got a job um, selling washing machines and fridges and televisions in a in a quite a famous high street store in the UK at the time. Uh, and that lasted until I was about maybe nineteen years old. Uh, and I realised that um, I had to leave. It really wasn't the place for me. Um, and it was a hasty decision, to be honest with you. Um, I absolutely took the decision on a whim. Uh, and it turned out for the best because my old dad, God bless his soul, um, he was fed up with me hanging around the house uh, and he wrote to his area manager in Leeds to see if there were any jobs for me on the railway. Uh, and as it turns out, there was. Just a few weeks later, I was to become the relief clerk for the Wakefield area, selling tickets, processing parcels, managing the information office at Wakefield Westgate Station. And then consequently, over about five years, I moved through various clerical roles across many departments and disciplines until I found myself working in Sheffield and dealing, believe it or not, with customer complaints on a daily basis. Uh, But this eventually led to me uh, taking on the role of uh, of a kind of customer service specialist and uh, uh, a junior customer services manager uh, during the mid-80s. Then it was about uh, about this time uh, that I was working with these guys that that I got the opportunity to become involved and to become trained as a trainer, particularly in the field of leadership, teamwork, customer service, We were doing a a whole raft of frontline training across the the region based on an Anglo-Danish model. Uh, And at the time, British Rail was also starting a a radical programme, which introduced the concept of total quality management. Uh, Through my involvement with this kind of local training programme, I was put in the spotlight, if you will, with with a, a number of the training teams that were being set up nationally. And consequently, yeah, just purely... Through, through luck, through, through serendipity, you kind of get noticed by the people who were making moves at the time. And I was invited to become part of a delivery team um, within the eastern region based in York uh, as a full-time trainer. 
And that was just like heaven for me because, you know, I'd, I'd really found a, a, that I was a reasonably good trainer. And this gave me the opportunity to, to build on those skills and to learn much more about, you know, the psychology and the sociology and the, the, the nature of the models of, of leadership and teamwork that were, uh, that were essential to delivering a total quality management package. At that time, I met some really, really good, good people. And I've, I've, I've got to mention some names as I go along the way here, you know, but people yeah. like, uh, like Rod Cole, who was part of the team, the delivery team is, is a great mentor to me. And the, and the team manager, Jenny Clark, um, she, she actually put herself out to help people. And I owe a lot to her in terms of, of being able to, to, to pursue the career that I, that I ultimately had within, within the rail industry. So that, that kind of led me into getting noticed. You know, you kind of you kind of go into those national um, schemes. I mean, if, if you look at the scale of the training program that was being put on by by these guys, you, know, you were talking about a, a residential training program for in excess of um, a hundred to one hundred twenty five thousand people who were working for British Rail at the time. Amazing. Uh, and I and I I got to work with whole. Rats of different people from engineering organizations to customer service organizations uh, to people who who dealt with uh, you know the day to day traveling public on stations right through to people who who managed the telecoms network within within transport and and everything in between and it was just a fascinating time to be involved with that process um, that in itself uh, gave me the opportunity to again become noticed by a, a group that were just setting up in in Derby, a group called quality and safety services. Uh, they were set up uh, under a guy that I have a lot of time for, the, the, a, a guy who, again, steered my career, um, a chap called Phil Page. He gave me the opportunity to work in, in quality and safety services to head up their ISO 9000 training team. Um, as a group, the, uh, the, the organisation was designed to help all of the maintenance depots that were, that were within the rail, uh, rail industry at the time achieve ISO 9000, or, or BF, BS 5750 as it was at the time, but the ultimately ISO 9000 certification for each of the depots within uh, the, the railway family. As a result of that, within weeks, I found myself invited to be a part of the first ISO 9000 training programme and, and, and consultancy programme in heavy rail in Hong Kong. So from joining as a, as a full-time trainer in, in York, to getting on the plane to Hong Kong for a, a six-week stint of training development and, and stage setting for a, for a consultancy program was probably about eight months. Uh, and, yeah. and it was it was just a fantastically hair-raisingly exciting ride, a bit like a, a roller coaster in, in many respects, because we had ups and downs all the way through that. It might have been. The very fact that I came to Australia... Um, really got in the way of me using that um but but all of that time it was just kind of really exciting and, and really developmental so yeah kind of ultimately i left that organization around about the time of privatization and i went and, and set up my own little uh, consultancy sole trader sort of thing and i used that time i think very very productively and i spent time sharing the parenting of our two young boys um, with my wife, who was, who was working as a part-time nurse, and I was working as a part-time consultant. So for their formative years, their preschool years, massively privileged to be involved in, in their development. And it was only really when full-time school came along that I was tempted to go back into, into full-time consultancy. And I found myself working uh, for a friend who had won a contract with London Underground. On the central line, um, which is where I was based, uh, there were ha they were having some problems putting together a, a quality management system and a whole of life asset plan for their fleet. Uh, so I went down there and spent a number of years helping them uh, set those things up. And again, I, I, I just met some some lifelong friends in, in in that scenario. Also during that time, was the most interesting perhaps uh, uh, of, of my career in that um, we were halfway through developing the the newer concepts for the whole of life asset management process for the fleet when the infamous Chancery Lane derailment accident happened. Yeah, I heard about it. Uh, you bought it, and that was my question, because um, when I investigated about Andrew, that is yourself, uh, when I looked into your story, this was one of my questions, that uh, there was a technical investigation into the train accident at Central Line, which is uh, London Underground Limited. What was the story behind it, and what role did you play, Andy? 
Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, most of the work I was doing at the time was was on supporting the uh, the quality manager for um, for the central line uh, based at Ricelip Depot, uh, a guy called Dave Piri. Again, I, I, I'm still lifelong friends with Dave. He, you know, we, we spent a lot of time sorting things out. And at, at the same time, I also met my new business partner, a guy called Andy, Andy Hills, and we set up a company called uh, called Holosys, through which we worked with Dave uh, on the the technical investigation that you talk about. In essence, we were we were in the process of building fairly robust and financially uh, managed arguments for increased investment in whole of life uh, asset management for the central line fleet. There, there were some significant issues that were, that were happening with the fleet at the time that, were, that we were attempting to manage on a almost on a day to day or a week to week basis. But during the latter part of two thousand two to and early two thousand and three. There were a couple of minor incidents with with the train, in, in that on a couple of occasions the traction motor uh, on one of the bogies became detached and caused the, uh, the 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 carriage to run up and over the the, the motor. It was ne- it was never considered at the time that this was an endemic problem um, until the two thousand and three Chantry Lane incident, where exactly the same thing happened to a train in service. It could have been far more serious, I think, than than it actually turned out to be in that uh, the train was just pulling out of Chantry Lane and entering the tunnel. So it was, it was going at very low speed when the, the detachment happened. So consequently, the, uh, the amount of damage and the, the injuries that were caused as a result of the accident were almost minimal. But it obviously ran up a, a, um, a number of red flags uh, to, to the organisation. Consequently, the organisation decided to withdraw service on, on the central line until the fleet was, was deemed to be safe. And that took several months. So if you, if you can imagine the amount of money that needed to be invested yeah. uh, and the amount of commitment in the organisation actually to remove service of a, of a very, very busy, if not the busiest line on, in, in London Underground for a period of months, whilst this, this particular issue um, got handled. The biggest learning, I think, in terms of... of for me, in terms of, of culture in this, was shortly after the, the accident, we'd been making a number of presentations about the whole of life asset and uh, yeah, the amount of planning and the amount of changes that needed to be done to the uh, uh, maintenance regime. And we were in the process of this when, when the accident happened, and we'd made a number of significant presentations to some, some of the, uh, the holders of the purse strings. And a few weeks after the accident, one of those people that we presented to, one of the financial people that we presented to, openly and in open conversation asked us, if we had done what it was, what you were proposing, would this accident have happened? And, you know, for, for anybody who's involved in assurance or engineering activity, you know, they, it, it kind of like it, it becomes a little bit of a red blood moment. You know, you kind of, the blood wells up behind your eyes and you, and you kind of get a little bit angry, but, you know... We we live in a, in an environment, or we we, we lived in a, in a in an era, where the majority of the things that that we that we took action upon were almost retrospective. You know, we we had yeah. to wait for something to happen in order to put the investment into it. This was a a, a, a warning. It was it was a it was a, a siren to to actually say, look, no, we if, to, if we're going to do this right, we need to put a detailed amount of investment in, and consequently. I was heavily involved in the in the processes by by which the new um, asset uh, management regime was put in. We introduced a number of new safety practices. Um, we were even the first organisation to employ a team of independent safety assessors, and, and we went through a process of um, uh, of, in, of interviewing uh, and, and prioritising. A number of aircraft engineers who were specialist safety checking engineers to come on board and, and make sure that the corrective actions that we were putting in place, the retrospective corrective actions we're putting in place, were done properly and that um, the actions that were seen to be corrective, uh, i.e., we, we put strengthened safety, bol- uh, safety housings in, we improved the way in which the, the engine uh, uh, was mounted on the, on the bogey. And we even did stringent quality checks on the on the uh, supply of those uh, of those safety housings. All of that needed to be done with total total confidence. So everything that we did in in that time and, and space was designed to make sure that when the when the central line went back out into service, it was both ready for its its daily uh, routines, but the engineering and maintenance activity that went alongside it were robust and appropriate as well. Well, genius. It's a great team effort. Appreciate that. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great insight into the technical investigation, Andy. And uh, you also included that your move to Australia as well, so to the to the happening city Sydney. Mm. So, what made you move to regional then? Well, it, in, initially, I was I was kind of like I, I suppose the work I'd been doing with with in, in London got some attention. Uh, and I found myself uh, receiving a job offer from the uh, Infrastructure Development Corporation in Sydney. Uh, I know it was a, a, an interview process, um, and I know I got selected above um, a, a couple of Australian candidates. Uh, but I think it was based on the fact that what we were doing with with assurance and with and with engineering was was a little bit different from what was currently happening in Australia. Um, and there had been uh, one or two problems in building. Uh, retrospective and robust safety arguments for some of the the assets that were being built for uh, for New South Wales. So I found myself working in the infrastructure, Devel- infrastructure development corporation, and then quickly after that, I got invited to be a a, a part of uh, uh, the safety team that was being set up by a, a gentleman by the name of Graham Jackson. Again, another person I, I owe a lot to in terms of my my professional development. Graham was the the new head of safety for um, uh, for the uh, infrastructure development corporation, and he decided that he wanted me as part of his team in the in the role of systems and engineering assurance. Um, so, so during that time, I, I built up a um, with, with the help of a very talented team. I, I'm, I'm going to take total um, uh, total responsibility or uh, or credit for that. But we built up a number of, of very robust systems um, by which we were able to um, build and support the safe delivery of, of new assets, new and altered assets that were that were being provided to transport for New South Wales. And then I would I was I was invited by Graham to, to have a, a meeting with a, with a guy called Jim Modravanus, who was the uh, chief engineer of Railcorp at the time. And Jim had been asked to set up a, a new asset standards organisation in Transport for New South Wales, which ultimately became the Asset Standards Authority. Um, and between them, Graham and, and Jim facilitated a way for me to, to join that establishment team. So, yeah, I spent a good nine months um, working on the safety argument, working with the regulator, uh, et cetera, to, do, to develop, a, again, a, a, a robust understanding of how this organisation was to work and influence industry. And then when we actually got to the uh, nitty-gritty of, of working with the ASA, I was lucky enough to land the role of director with responsibility for uh, safety, quality, environment, human factors, risk, engineering, shows, and several other things, which were far too a very interesting role. Uh, and I spent the next five years thoroughly enjoying working within within transport for new south wales and working within uh, a group of uh, of 100 plus very very talented people uh and then came 2019 yeah uh and i got the opportunity to uh, to move on to take redundancy and i figured it was the right time um so so moving to region in answering that question is the reason we moved to region was because of my wife's illness which initially was diagnosed with uh, uh, menopausal symptoms, but just before Christmas in, in 2019, uh, probably the second or third, it could have been the fourth doctor that we saw, uh, eventually sent her for a scan. The worst memory I have of that Christmas is, is actually sitting in the waiting room of the, uh, uh, the place where she'd had the scan. Uh, and a, uh, an attendant came back through the private door, picked up the phone and said, to someone at the other end. She said, hello, yes, I need to speak to Dr. Whoever about Susan Tankard's scan results. And it was like, at that moment, my my heart sank because we knew then it was something serious and it was something that um, would ultimately put our lives into chaos for, for almost two years. Sorry to hear about it, Andy. A very emotional story. And I appreciate your support to your wife. Moving forward, into the interview my next question is what is nsw country safety risk services ethics motives and reason behind its concept Uh, what made you to do this uh, especially to help uh, the regional uh, new south wales and also i know that uh, it's definitely a great initiative for the regional areas i really appreciate your efforts is there anything that the railway community can help in achieving these objectives? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go through it. I mean, New South Wales Country Safety Risk Services kind of tends to, to speak for itself. I mean, we, we call ourselves New South Wales Country SRS. Um, but we, we 
we we were set up initially. I, I, I was I was looking to see what opportunities there were. Um, I didn't really fancy going back and doing a doing kind of locum consultancy or, or you know I'd got lots of offers for bits and pieces of work that that I could do and and it was like I don't really want to do it. I've done that. I've, I've been there and, and and you know we've worked in that space. So I started to look around at what was happening in in the local regions and particularly uh, in the Riverina region. Um, it's quite a large area, but we 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 include them just sit about the middle of it. And the major city, for those that don't know the Riverina, is, is Wagga Wagga, which has taken me several months to, to get the pronunciation right. Um, but I started to look at what was happening in, in that area, and um, I, I, I got in touch with a, with a guy from our local, and he told me about, within details, the worth of infrastructure and energy projects, uh, ready to start, or actually programmed to start, within the, within the next five years. Um, so then, on the back of that, I started researching, you know, kind of like, what was happening from from government initiatives, and it, and it was quite clear that, that a number of regional government departments are starting to build in regional legacy requirements into their contracts, and in doing that, they are mandating tier one and tier two suppliers to to ensure that the work that they do is not just for the benefit of the project it's not just for the benefit of the duration of the project but they build things into the working within region that it that leaves a legacy that that enables the the, the economy and the community to grow on the back of their presence in in that in that area um so yeah we tended to think about what we could do with that uh, and then the second side of it was i was speaking to uh, our local mp uh, a lady called Steph Cook, who a very interesting and, and dynamic character, um, and she was telling me about her responsibility recently for uh, ensuring that uh, a, a, a number of new ambulance stations were, were have been built in 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 her. Uh, um, but what she wanted to do as as a part of that was to ensure that local businesses benefited, so that we used local carpenters, we used local plumbers, we used local electricians. Um, but when push came to shove, we found she found that actually she couldn't get any local suppliers to work on these projects. And the main, main reason that she couldn't get the local suppliers to work on the projects was they were not sophisticated enough to be able to have the systems necessary to meet the procurement requirements or um, mature enough to start building compliance, safety and assurance arguments with the, with the, the work that we're doing. So that, that's, th those two functions actually kind of built the concept of New South Wales country SRS and we, and we we launched the concept in in February uh, and we're in the process at the moment of, of putting together our our, our, our team of directors uh, a number of people have come on board uh, and we should be incorporating the company very soon so the the, the two offerings that we that we put are uh, we, we're looking to provide a team of local and regionally based capability in work health safety engineering safety quality risk hazard management and project management, offering package solutions to tier one and tier two suppliers who are keen to partner with regional organisations and we can help facilitate their local and regional sustainability and economic growth obligations. But as well as that, we offer a service to small regional businesses who wish to work for tender, in, uh, to, to tender for work in their larger government sponsored projects, but don't have those systems or, or assurance management systems to comply with the standard procurement tender requirements. So to that end, we're in the process of building a system or a, a group of systems uh, which can be used as locum management systems for small businesses. And, we, and we're looking to, to partner with them uh, to enable them, A, to get through the procurement process, and then B, to deliver the quality requirements and, and project management requirements that, that are required of them as a part of their due diligence and, and assurance. But, the, but ultimately, and I think this is probably the most important part of the, the, the business ethic, is that everything that we do is about developing a series of cohorts of emerging capability and talent sourced, trained and resident in regional New South Wales, who we can actively, who can actually actively support the large number of projects and business opportunities that are here over the next number of years. So, you know, you, you say, is there anything that the railway community can, can do to help? And I think, you know, First and foremost, I want to say to, to my old colleagues out there, we're, we're not attacking the markets of Sydney or Melbourne or even London or, or Riyadh or, or wherever. Um, what we're doing here is solely about developing a locally trained and sourced cohort of emerging talent. We are regionally based and we understand the local markets and the, and the local community. And yeah, our, our, our new mantra, um, which we're starting to put on our, on our marketing uh, materials, is world-class capability available locally. 
which is which is really, really what we're about in that. So, you know, we, we, we're providing that enabling vehicle for local businesses. We're providing the, uh, the, the vehicle by which we can build this local cohort. cohort. So we're looking for a, a few things from, from the, uh, the, the business community, the government community and the railway community. The first is, yeah, we need city-based companies looking to partner regional facilitators to help manage their contractual and legacy obligations. We need companies and people who can give their time and support to our emerging talent base through either sponsorship, mentoring, or maybe even internships. Yeah. We're looking for tree changers, people who have moved into region but have not had the opportunity to use their capabilities since they've been here and are probably working at Bunnings or somewhere like that now. Uh, but you know, we just need their CVs and their, their activities for maybe two or three days a month just to do some contract work. And we're always looking for investors. You know, whilst we're a business and a successful business makes money, uh, yeah, we're keen that the New South Wales Country SRS leave a sustainable legacy for New South Wales. Uh, and we're always interested in talking to people who can make that happen quicker. And then over and above that, anybody who's interested or motivated by what we're doing, ideas, supporters, advocates are always welcome. And finally, just, just in terms of a local connection, I've also just joined the, uh, the new Kootamundra District Co-op uh, as a director. Uh, and, it, and you know, I'm beginning to really value the concept and value of cooperatives and cooperative thinking, and I'm, I'm potentially looking to introduce some, some of that thinking within to New South Wales Country SRS. Congratulations, Sandy, for the new role. Amazing. I, I really. Uh, it, it's a volunteer uh, role, but anyway, yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> no, no, it is. Doesn't it, it is a volu- Doesn't matter. It is a voluntary or not. But uh, what you're doing is a really great initiative you took up. Uh, you're trying to build your own uh, competency capabilities regionally, and not depending on the cities. It is a really great initiative, and I think this podcast can go forward, and it might actually bring some people in who actually want to do mentorship and who want to bring their capabilities and their skill set developed within regional. And, I, I hope so. I, when, whenever I talk to someone, that I, I, I get the impression that, that they like the concept. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're completely open. If, if anybody wants to talk to us, make the contact. Do you want to share your email ID or any contact details if people want to contact you? Yeah, sure. Well, the first I would say is yeah, the, we have a, a website. Um, we have a LinkedIn page. All of our contact details are on both of those. Uh, my LinkedIn profile is also connected to to both of those things. Um, but if you have any questions or queries, I mean, just, just send us an email at info at nswcountrysafetyrisk.com.au. Brilliant, Andy. Before I let you go, I would like to ask, what is the one piece of advice you want to give us to our listeners? It, yeah, after 30 to 40 years, it's hard to give one piece of advice. But I'll, 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 I'll give the advice that I gave to my kids. And that's, in your life, find something that you love and do it to the best of your ability. And then I think you'll find that the universe will probably reward you as a result of doing that. Oh, and just as a PS... Don't be afraid to reinvent yourself. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, we would take that, Andy, that piece of advice. And Andy, it's been a privilege to listen to your story. And I genuinely appreciate your efforts for what you're doing for regional New South Wales. Thank you for joining our podcast and sharing your experiences and story. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railwaytransportationsystems at gmail.com. Thank you for your time today. See you next fortnight. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourself.